Thank you, Rosemary. So you can't compare just anybody to Bruce Lee. I've known Preston Powell for almost a decade. He and I are vendors at the Nike Farmer's Market. As a child, I admired few people on the planet as much as I did Bruce Lee. So when I repeated in one of my sketch log columns an extremely flattering phrase that I heard about Preston, I did so without any hesitation. Preston Powell is the Bruce Lee of loose tea. And like any great tea, a, a person is a combination of cultivation and a specific blend of events. Here tonight, we will explore the life experiences and cultural ingredients that have produced Preston Powell, Nyack's beloved tea sommelier, sensei, an entrepreneur who you may not have known was a major league, league music impresario and a scion of the, of the, of the um, family that produced the first African-American elected to the United States Congress from New York, Adam Clayton Powell. Preston will share many rare photos tonight and stories that have never been shared beyond the family dinner table. And you may also learn how to make the perfect cup of tea. So let's start by going back in the day. Please excuse me while I transition to my slideshow. You're too kind, Bill, you're too kind. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Preston. So, here we go. One second, please. I think I need to start again. You, you, you uh, thank me too quickly. Can you see the first slide? I Very see. good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and this slide. So while you look at this picture from the uh, first grade elementary school in Wyandanche, New York, in the chat, why don't you uh, see if you can find Preston? We all have these photographs and that's one of my favorite things to do when a friend shows me their early elementary school picture. I just go through all those faces. <laughs> I'm, not even sure. I'm not even sure if I can find me, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you don't recognize yourself. No, so uh, I'll, I'll help you out if you haven't <laughs> said in the chat that you anybody find him yet. You can tell me in the chat if you have. There we go. Who who's the winner? We we could have given a prize. No, I can't <laughs> see the full name, but um, I'll, I'll show you here. <laughs> nice. That that's uh that's Preston. So so tell me when I looked at this picture, what I noticed was the teacher, and I just thought that was interesting in the early '60s that there was an African American uh, elementary school teacher. Yeah, that, 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 that was a, that was unusual. Web. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and yeah. tell me a little bit more about the wine dance. Well, wine dance. Um, that that teacher. Her name was Mrs. Webb. I I still remember her to this day. Um, um, she had a profound impact. Um, very nurturing. Just wonderful teacher. I just I, you know, many teachers. I I don't remember everything, but Mrs. Webb really stood out. Stood out, and I I, I kept that photo. But Wine Danch is, um, was a tough town. Um, that's where I learned, you know, at some point I'm gonna have to teach young kids how to protect themselves from bullies and, uh, you know, to step, to step up and to take care of themselves. Um, Wine Danch was pretty tough at that time. Um, and uh, um, so that's one of the reasons also that I love teaching martial arts. And I see very diverse. So there's, there's our young, Hold on one second. Why am I not advancing? Hold on. There's our young Preston. Uh -huh. And here now a family photo. So okay. who are we looking at in this picture? And so, where, where was it taken? Sure. So this was taken uh, East Chop, Oak Bluffs, Massachusetts, um, Martha's Vineyard. Uh, on the left is my dad, Preston. Um, in the middle is Isabel, my grandmother. And next to him, the tall one, that's Adam, um, Isabel's husband. And the gentleman uh, is one of the uh, parishioners from the Abyssinia Baptist Church that we invited up to the house for that weekend. And as I was saying, most of the photos, you couldn't take a photo back at that time period without showing a fish. I mean, that was the thing. You, you showed your bounty. You came home from fishing and you had to show your catch. And that's a photo coming back from uh, fishing. So this is the Adam Clayton Powell that you knew, but most of the world 
this is the Adam Clayton Powell that they knew. So this so, is Adam Clayton Powell in 1941 being uh, sworn in to the New York City Council by Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia, right? That's LaGuardia, correct. And so um, to the far right, well, next to LaGuardia, that's Adam Sr., um, um, uh, old man Powell, and the Adam's father, Isabel, uh, Adam swearing in his hand up, and next to, that's his mother, so that's Maddie, uh, uh, Powell. Um, so that was, yeah, being sworn in with Mayor LaGuardia. But for me, you know, growing up and, you know, being very young, hearing the stories, the Adam that we know was Adam with a Bible under one arm, a picket sign in one hand, and a fishing reel in the other. That was the Adam I knew before politics and, you know, Congress and, and that thing. So let's meet more, let's see more of your grandparents. So this is, explain what this is and, and actually where you found it too. So, yeah, so this was a program. Um, Adam and Isabel had gotten married uh, at the church. Uh, it was a big wedding. Um, she, I remember her saying to me that they, she cut probably two, 3,000 pieces of cake to give out and the Cotton Club girl dances, the church was packed. All the showgirls were outside. And of course, a lot of the deacons wanted to be at the front door <laughs> because um, you know everyone was out front. And then of course the church was packed. But this was a, um, a program that the church put together for the World's Fair. I I'm not sure if it was the very first World's Fair, but they did a major promotion and they showed Adam and talked about his life, You know, him going to Colgate, um, him traveling the world and uh, and also featuring Isabel that they were together as uh, a married couple working together in the church, uh, Abyssinia Baptist Church. And I found this in some of Bill's, um, um, some of Isabel's um, um, belongings. And it was so well kept. I thought it was like a new magazine. I almost threw it out. Uh, so she loved Adam. She loved being a part of the church. And a lot of people don't know that she left show business to marry Adam. They, they basically, her, um, Adam's father said, you know, if you want to marry her, um, she's going to have to leave show business and uh, uh, come into the church. And she took that on with no problem. Um, she taught the tiny tots. Uh, so many um, students came to her and she was a major part of the, the church. This is what she left. Yeah, that's what she left, right. So of course, you know, she was a showgirl. Um, that was from um, Bambula, uh, one of the uh, productions she was in. Um, and she, she was in many. She, she danced at the Cotton Club. Um, she was a showgirl. And she was just starting to do major Broadway stuff uh, when, when um, she had to leave show business and um, to marry into the family. Sorry, I'm just having a little mm -hmm. problem advanced time. Wow. So that's that's Bell um, and uh, Bambula, another scene, um, you know, very uh, feisty. Uh, that's who, that's what Adam saw and fell in love with. Um, that's Isabel Washington Powell, that's my grandmother. And just a wonderful lady. And, um, and again, um, to be married to someone and, you know, years later to be divorced and to still love this man and keep everything intact. And we'll talk about those things later, how she knew the significance of who he would be and the legacy. And uh, she knew that then and to this day. So that's... So this uh, is go on, sister, Bill. right? So, this right, so this... Go on. You want me to go to the next no, one? No, no, I thought you were saying something. So, this oh, no, is, no, please. yeah, this is Isabel in the center and Freddie Washington. So we talk about Adam, we talk about politics. These women were the cornerstone of, you look at um, the Afro-American, uh, I look at, I'm, not thinking of, I'm thinking now of like Black Lives Matter and activism. Freddie was so uh, 
imagine in the 20s going to Europe, going to Paris, uh, dancing all over the world and coming home and being denied certain things. So she had a major voice. She, she started the Negro uh, Actors Guild. Um, so this photo was uh, Isabel with Freddie at um, the Ziegfeld Theater um, and uh, at, at, a, at a play. Yeah, so, and that's Freddie Washington. Yeah, so that's Freddie. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a, a production called Mama's Daughter, uh, 1939, I believe. Uh, Freddie, um, again, back at that day, she really was a groundbreaker for um, uh, people of color, uh, black actors, um, and she broke through um, uh, the barrier at that time. We're talking late. Uh, 20s, early 30s, uh, doing Broadway plays. And then eventually um, she starred in Imitation of Life, uh, 1934, uh, Cole, Cole Colbert's um, um, production, the, the very first uh, Imitation of Life. And this um, photograph was, I think, taken by the great James Vandersee, because it's yes. the Van Damme studio right. mm -hmm. in Harlem. So this is her sister again, this is Freddie? This is Freddie again. So Freddie, um, you know, I think in the twenties, she went to uh, France, uh, Europe. She danced all over Europe. This was this was the Freddie that went as a dancer. Um, um, it was her and more um, Freddie and Moet, I believe it was called. And when she came home, she knew she had to change things in Harlem. So this whole Harlem Renaissance. Um, this is when she really started to speak out um, about the political situation, you know, uh, black people, people of color, um, you know, uh, actors not getting work, only being able to, to play at certain theaters, but then you can't go to the bathroom. So she really um, took it into her own hands as a female uh, artist to, to get that word out. And didn't she have a column you mentioned? Yeah, so she eventually um, hooked up with Adam Adam um, had a column called The People's Voice, and Adam asked Freddie to come in and write a column called Freddie Says. And in that column, she would talk about the different Black plays and productions and who was doing what, kind of like a billboard of today, um, but for African-American um, dancers, musicians, and, and also uh, activists and talking about, you know, uh, what can we do to start a union and these kind of things. A couple more photos of their work. These are the sisters together? Yeah, so those are the Washington sisters. On the left is Freddie, you know, and Belle uh, in the middle. Uh, and this was Singing Blues, uh, another major production. And Belle would tell us that Freddie being the big sister, and they would call her Big Sis or the General. I mean, Freddie was pretty tough. I mean, Freddie didn't take any mess. I remember when I would talk to Freddie, I would say, hey, Freddie, how are you? She said, boy, how are you doing in school? I mean, she would cut straight to the chase. And she wanted to know, how are your grades? You know, what do you plan on doing when you get out of school? She was very, very about her business. And uh, she didn't want Isabel to get into the show business because she knew, you know, what it was like at that time. But Belle loved theater and, uh, of course, you know, uh, went into uh, theater. So this is them together in singing blues. So this is um, uh, taken in Harlem? Yeah, so this is during the time um, when Adam would walk the streets of Harlem. This is 125th Street. After Sunday service, it would stroll in the community to check on his brothers and sisters. And if he would, and he would talk to a lot of the, you know, parishioners and the different deacons and just the local folk to say what's happening. And then he would go back to the church and he would say, hey, you know, we can't, you know, don't buy what you can't work, you know. And he would, you know, basically walk 125th Street and start picketing and saying, if, you know, if you're not going to hire people of color, black people, then we're not going to buy from your shop. And, it's, and, and Bell would tell me stories how he would come up, try to figure out ways to protest like a soft protest. So if the mob bell didn't want to hire blacks during that time, he said, okay, this is what we're going to do. 
after the Sunday, you have to pay your phone bill, but we're gonna pay, it, pay your phone bill in pennies because it's legal tender. So imagine everyone in Harlem paying their phone bill with pennies. After about three or four months, they called the church and said, Reverend, what do we got to do? You know, what does it take to, you know, to fix this? And these were the ways that, you know, you talk about civil rights. I mean, this was Mr. Civil Rights. And we're talking early 30s, 30, you know, early, late 20s, early 30s. Um, and uh, he, wow. helped, yeah, he helped get a lot of uh, black people and people of color to work at the uh, Harlem Hospital, um, um, the telephone company. Um, and basically, don't don't shop where you can't work. You know, don't buy from where you can't work. Don't shop. That penny technique. I, I read that in Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, and I, I didn't know he got it from uh, Adam Clayton Powell. That's right. So now this this picture. What's going on here? Where are we now? So and, uh, now really this is Oak Bluffs, Massachusetts. Um, this is the Bunny Cottage, and you know we're in the month of April. Adam met Bell in April uh, for Easter. And the first thing Adam, when he saw Bell from what, from what she would tell me is that immediately he fell in love and Adam said, can I call you uh, Bunny Girl? And Bell said, only if I can call you Bunny Boy. And they, you know, so when they bought the house, they called the house the Bunny Cottage. So that's how the bunnies came about. Bunny Boy, Bunny Girl. And the bunnies, as you see, uh, symbolize the uh, bunny cottage. Yeah. Um, and so you told me that some of these materials that you've been able to preserve from your family, including those bunnies there, have been uh, donated to uh, yeah. a very important institution in America. You want to mention that? Sure. So, so the house is on the, the Massachusetts uh, registry. And... Uh, the Smithsonian came in um, and they started the African-American wing um, of natural uh, American history and basically um, asked me to donate certain uh, artifacts from the house for a permanent uh, exhibi ex exhibition that's being held in DC. And we donated the, um, the bunnies, the two original bunnies, uh, some of uh, Isabel's fishing hats, to symbolize the love for fishing and, uh, and Adam's uh, fishing poles. And also the guest book. There was a guest book and, at the Bunny Cottage and it showed where Matthew Henson, um, who was an um, amazing explorer, was the first one on the North Pole. Um, and uh, uh, Louis Armstrong, uh, Paul Robinson. So all, you could see all the entries where they sign, you know, hey, Bell, hey, Adam, we had a great weekend, blah, blah, blah. So that, that was all donated to the Smithsonian for this special wing. And it's a beautiful um, uh, wing of, of Martha's Vineyard. It shows the Shera Cottage, which was the first um, inn that Adam and Isabel would go to. And when they got married, they honeymooned there and they loved the island. And then eventually, uh, bought the, uh, the Bunny Cottage, which was a barn, which was then, you know, built up, you know, to, to, to the cottage that it is today. Yeah, I have another um, photo here. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, so that's a, that's a, a photo of the, the front porch. So I'm hoping to one day um, soon, um, you know, uh, my daughter's 18 now, my son's 21, uh, to be able to summer full-time as my grandmother did and my grandfather did and to basically turn the house into a non-for-profit 501c3, uh, similar to the, uh, the Hopper House here in Nyack, where people can walk through the house and see uh, there's gonna be a Freddie Washington room with all her um, um, speeches and all her uh, plays and Broadway productions. Uh, there's gonna be a um, Matthew Henson room with the artifacts. Each time he came, he gave uh, Isabel and Adam a gift um, we'll show those gifts uh, in that room. Uh, this is going to be a Haile Selassie room for the respect of Ethiopia um, and for um, His Majesty coming to Harlem with Adam. Um, and of course, the Bunny Boy, Bunny Girl room. So it's a beautiful house. Everything's original. Nothing's been changed since 1933. And it's been my job um, and my family to keep it intact as it was 
um, not changed, not Hamptonized, not no air conditioning, just the cottage the way it was from you know the late 1930s. Incredible, incredible. So a couple more of your uh, grandfather. Yeah. What's the so, name of the boat? So, so that's called. So the boat was called the Bunny, of course. <laughs> so uh, that's Adam on water in his glory. Uh, love the water and love fishing. And, uh, and this is why I love Watertown. That actually was what brought me to um, Nyack. Um, you know, summering and growing up on the vineyard every summer as a kid, being by the water, being with boats, fishing. When I first saw the vista coming over the Tappan Sea Bridge and saw Nyack, I knew right away um, I was in love. And uh, I love Watertowns. And so this is Adam in his glory, Oak Bluffs Mass, Harbor hanging out, heading out to uh, go fishing. I got some more water for you. Okay. So again, um, back in the day, if you had that's to show- That's your dad, right? That's my dad. If you had to show a photo, you have to show it with a fish. So um, that's my father, Preston, and that's Adam's uh, mother. So that's Mother Powell, um, Hattie Mother Powell, um, taking a look at, uh, which looks like a totog, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, a day of fishing. And that looks like that was probably taking the fall, Indian summer, probably late September. This, this, this looks like a, a commercial for a soft drink. I was going to say that, right? Right. So here we have um, in the back, that's my dad, that's Preston. Um, um, Adam to the left. Uh, to the right is Isabel. And in the front is Freddie. That's Freddie holding a bottle of, I don't know if that's soda or champagne. Um, but again, you can see a fishing pole in Adam's hand. They had just come from fishing and they were probably docking the boat and uh, coming in. And this is in Egertown. Um, uh, There's a lovely crabbing spot that my father turned me on to and Adam turned my father on to. So that's my father pressing the left with Adam uh, fishing, I'm, I'm sorry, um, clamming in, in Egertown. And you can see Adam has his beard showing, you know, when he was in the, uh, the vineyard, you know, you let your hair down, you grow your beard, you hang out. It, it was just great times. It, you were so, you know, back, again, we're talking, you know, late 1930s, early 40s to, to, be, to be able to free up and just, you know, let your hair back. And that time was amazing. That's why Martha's Vineyard is such a very special place. And now this is uh, getting closer to now. Right, so getting close. So that's, that's me with my sister Tia in our dinghy, um, not called the bunny too, <laughs> just a dinghy, um, just rowing out in the Oak Bluffs Harbor. And now getting closer. Now we're getting close. So this is me with my family. Um, that's my wife, Trang, on the left in the, um, I guess that's like a pink color. Um, Jade, my daughter, um, with the smirk on her face, and my son, Alex, under my arms. And that was in the gallery up in, um, um, in Oak Bluffs um, one summer. That's Jade. Um, so that's in the Bunny Cottage. Um, the, in the background, um, that's a painting that uh, uh, a friend of ours did. Uh, I'm just looking at that in the background. And, uh, um, that, that's a new addition. We put that over the stove. But that's Jade in uh, Oak Bluffs. Um, and Jade is now 18. She just turned 18. And this is Preston Alexander, my son. We call him Alex because, you know, you're walking down the street, all the girls say, Preston, all three heads turn around. My dad, me, him. So we, we call him <laughs> Alexander. So that's Preston Alexander. Um, and and here I put this Nyack together. High school. That was Nyack High School. I put this I put this together for you because it shows the uncanny resemblance. Wow. Nice. There we go. So, T Jevity. T Jevity. So, um, as I said, you know, people are a blend of uh, things, and, and your brand is infused with um, the, the culture of martial arts and. Um, your experience in music. So I, want, I wanted to know in your formative years, what was your biggest influence? Was it martial arts or was it music? To be honest, Bill, you know, 
it was actually neither. Um, it, it was actually basketball. Well, fortunately, I have a slide for that. <laughs> right. Okay. So what was going on here? So that was um, um, a basketball game um, and me taking a jump shot. Uh, and that was when I was in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, and my first love was basketball. You know, I, you know, I was the first one in the gym, the last one out of the gym. And, you know, I always had a basketball in my hand, you know, two, in fact. You know, I remember stories when the Knicks would play, it was so intense for me. We, my dad would have to pull a car over and the LIE, the Long Island Expressway, just to listen to the, to the game. So I love basketball for sure. And it's a team sport. So here's the team. Tell me about this uh, victory. That was a YMCA team. That's a very old photo. Um, we won the championship that year. Um, I got MVP. Coach gave me the, the trophy. And that was a photo that they took that was published in the, in the, in the paper. Um, like I said, and the great thing, again, going back to Martha's Vineyard, all my fundamentals I learned, they had a summer basketball league and they still have it. And what amazing program. I mean, the fundamentals that I learned in Martha's Vineyard, Oak Plus, uh, is just unbelievable. That's actually what really helped me really love basketball. What I learned at those fundamentals in, uh, in Martha's Vineyard at the um, Oak Plus basketball court. So now on to your second love, music. Right. So music went out. Um, you know, the first time I heard uh, a disco DJ mix two songs together, I'll never forget. I was sitting in a car with a friend waiting for his sister to come to get in the car. We were going somewhere. And I heard this music coming out of his house. And the songs were like this dance beat. And then the each song would segue into another. I was like, oh, my, what is this? So I actually knocked on the guy's door. I said, listen, I'm, I'm hearing this music. What is this? He said, I'm a DJ. You know, I work at this club called the uh, Nuda Rooster. You know, are you into music? I said, absolutely. And his name was Skip Lulette. And Skip basically let me intern with him at his disco. I, I think I was 15 years old. Um, and what I did was I started my own mobile disco company. And we called it Disco Vibes Unlimited. And... Uh, at that time, they called me DJ Pleasure. <laughs> and that's how it I think started. I have your first card here. And that was my first business card. So that was the new ultimate high frequency Disco Vibes Unlimited. And at that it's time... When DJs had the, it's when DJs were spelled with the double E. Right. And you, had, and you had like, you know, everyone had a name, you know. Oh. Um, my name was DJ Pleasure. And you had like this opening. So mine was... You're listening to the sound of DJ Pleasure. Disco bopple in your mind, your body, of course, your soul, 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 soul. And you would start the first song. And what a love affair to have people dance in just, you know, we're talking like 70s, people stressed out from work. And on the weekends, they would go out and dance. And just what a great time. And this is one that, wow. So this is an early flyer um, from one of the parties we used to do. This is right before I started working in the, you know, real discotheques. This is more like, you know, you'd rent like the Nyack Center. I'd rent the VFW Hall. There was a uh, dance at the, um, up the, up, up the Uptown Hall. And um, you would go in, you'd bring your own equipment. You know, it was a dollar. Can you believe that? Dollar for women. <laughs> so, yeah, really great time. Wow. And this was um, at your high school. No, this was at high school or college? This is high school. So um, again, I love music so much. Um, I did a, uh, um, I got my third class uh, broad class engineering license at Yale University. They allowed me to take a course, a, a, a course. I think it was 15 or 16. And they were so impressed with, you know, how much I love music that they allowed me to intern. And I ended up having my own radio show on Yale University's WYBC. It was called Black Spectrum. And I used to do the like midnight to 4 a.m. shift playing disco records. This is when disco really, it was really hot. And at that time, you know, I was young, but I had all the records. So we had this really cool um, late night uh, disco show. And what happened is one of my teachers knew about it. Um, so they said to me, 
hey, Preston, would you mind coming in and doing 20 minutes in the morning for opening bell before class starts? So I would go in on Fridays and do the opening, you know, playing music and doing my little stick, you know, at, at high school um, um, before school started. So that's what that photo's from, yeah. And, th and, then, and then you graduated into this. Right. Where was this taken? So that's now we're working major discotheques. So that's me at Studio 54, um, you know, um, uh, doing a major party and uh, me at work, you know, focusing in on the next record, trying to blend that perfect mix. And what you wanted to do was, you know, keep the beat, keep the rhythm, keep the party going and segue the next song, still taking the dancers on a ride and creating an ambiance where there's fun and, and uh, love of joy of dancing, but still introducing new songs. And, you know, I'd love to play jazz, samba, funk, disco. I try to do a full blend of music, like a, a segue of, of different songs to create one long um, continuous loop of music for the, for the evening. So there you're um, the DJ in somebody else's club, but then you went on to own a club. So tell us about Bay Street. Bay Street, so, right. So, you know, most of the club DJs in Manhattan, you know, um, would play at the major clubs. And then in the summer, you would go out to the Hamptons and play the Hamptons, um, Southampton, East Hampton as a guest spot DJ from the city. And I fell in love with the Hamptons again just the same reason why I love um, Nyack uh, and Martha's Vineyard, it's a water town. So Sag Harbor was right on the waterfront and a friend of mine uh, told me about this space, Viviano Almonte, he was another DJ and he said, Preston, we should open up a club out here. So we went to look at it and it was a Grumman airplane hangar on the waterfront, on the Long Wharf in Sag Harbor, 10,000 square feet, our occupancy was 1,800 people on paper. What a beautiful club. And the first year we didn't get our liquor license. Uh, we had some problems, we had to change lawyers. And eventually um, to, to pay the rent, we, we kept it open as a roller skating rink. So you can see how big the floor was. So it was a roller skating rink for the local community. And then the, the final, I think the second year or the, the, that winter, we finally got a liquor license and we opened up as a full fledged um, nightclub and disco and we would do live concerts um, major productions um and just an amazing nightclub bay street nightclub Here, here's one of the ar artists you featured okay so richie is, havens who i, I yeah. actually got to tell preston that the the strange convergence of things is that a couple of steps from the farmer's market richie havens had a store on main street called kayak and nyack See, see, this is what I love about Nyack. I mean, it's just unbelievable the links um, this town has. You know, I never knew that, you know, but this photo was um, Richie Havens at Bay Street, uh, me with my tie-dye t-shirt on. We were doing a Woodstock um, uh, party and we had Country Joe. I think we had some of the members from Hot Tuna Richie Havens, and, and what's so funny, and this is what I love about the music business, sold out show, the morning of the show, I get a cease and desist hand delivered telegram telling me to cease and desist the show from the Woodstock Corporation because we used the peace, love and sign, <laughs> their logo on one of the flyers. And they said they were gonna close us down and uh, the show went on and it was, you know, it was a big show. And this was- well, Of course, a, what's that? Of course, the show went on. It had to. I think right. that's the evidence, right? Right. Well, there it is. Right. So that's my version of Jimi Hendrix. So we couldn't get Jimmy. So that, that was me as Jimi <laughs> Hendrix. <laughs> Here we go. And an another uh, performer who you got to know and who yeah. loved Bay Street. So um, Lenny Kravitz, um, you can tell by the coat, it was the fall of the year. And we went year round. So imagine late 80s, Lenny Kravitz, in the Hamptons, I mean, the tickets sold out. I, it was like instantly. Lenny came out, you know, saw the club, met me. Wow, a brother owns the club. I mean, we just hit it off. Um, and, you know, you know, what's so funny. A lot of times, you know, 
you know, like the production people come in and say, okay, we're here to do sound check. You know, who's the owner? You know, you know, where's the manager? I'm like, I'm the owner. Like, no, no, get us, get us the, the, the manager. We want to set up. And do it. I'm on the owner. What, what can I, can I help you? But um, <laughs> yeah, it, it was just, um, we did a lot of big acts. We had Madonna, Simply Red. Well, here we, here we go. Let's, let's, we go, we got two more in order. One, okay. one more before Madonna. Okay. So now um, this story is, um, you know, uh, Billy Joel hung out in the Hamptons. Um, and this is during the time when he was married to Christy Brinkley. And the club was hot. I mean, we had every, if there was any hot act performing in the New York area, they all played Bay Street. And what I figured out was in the city, I couldn't compete because they had exclusivity, but the Hamptons was so far away. So I would pick off all those acts that would come in that played all the major clubs in the city. So Billy came to us and said, hey, you know, we love the club. You've got great production, great lights. Can we rehearse in your club and work out a deal? We have to do a Madison Square Garden run of shows. And this would be the perfect place for us to kind of hang out at the beach, you know, we can rehearse, come and go. And I said, Billy, not a problem, but you have to play the club. And he agreed to do an impromptu concert. We weren't allowed to announce it prior. It was one of those, you know, radio announcements and it was just mobbed. And this was after the performance, um, I presented Billy with our Bay Street um, jacket. It was a really nice jacket. I gave one to Billy and to also to Christy, Christy Brinkley. Yeah, and you, you helped uh, launch this career too, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is um, Madonna. A lot of people didn't know, but Jellybean Benitez, um, who else, who, who really um, found Madonna, lived in my apartment building. And he, he actually helped me move from Washington, D.C. I, I went to school at Howard University. And when I was coming back to New York, helped me find my apartment. And... Bean and um, Madonna were very close and, you know, over, you know, as she was building her career, I was starting the club. So, of course, I brought her out and did all the marketing, took her to the radio stations, did press releases with her. And uh, she performed at the club and helped um, start her early career. And as you know, she just blew up and uh, the record company um, sent uh, me, a, you know, a platinum record for, um, you know, my early work with her um, back during the Bay Street days. But, but sports was never far away, was it? Sports wasn't far away, but I tell you, in the Hamptons, everybody came out. So this is Pele, Mr. Brazil. And I got to tell you, what a soccer player. So Pele used to hang out at the club. At that time, I'd heard of Pele, but I didn't know Pele, like I know him now, but oh my God, we had to create like a special VIP section because people mobbed him um, and he loved our club and would come out um, and hang out. And what a really nice, really nice guy. And to be honest, um, what I knew about um, Brazilians, I worked at a, another club in Manhattan called Club A, which was owned by a guy named Ricardo Amarel. He would come in and say, hello, hello. And um, so I could speak, you know, very, very little Portuguese. Um, and also in the vineyard, there's a lot of Portuguese that go to the vineyard, um, Cape Verde and stuff. So um, uh, Pele and I really hit it off. Um, and this was Pele and I, you know, um, at the club. So we've had the ingredients of family, basketball, music. So now the fourth ingredient. So the blend that is Preston Powell tea. Wow. So, so this... Yeah, you want to say anything, Bill, or you want me to? No, no, go ahead. Well, okay. I just yeah. What, sure. what was the role that this teacup played in, in your martial arts education? Because so, everything went sure. together. So basically, um, um, karate started in Okinawa. Uh, Okinawa was a chain of islands, the Ruku Islands, and um, there were peasants, there were farmers, and also you had royalty. You know, you had the royal family, and what had happened is the Japanese wanted to take over Okinawa and they would send in on horseback um, mean, mean people that would burn the, the peasants and the farmers land. Uh, they would tear down their structures. Um, they raped their women. It was really, and every season this would happen. So the Okinawans learned 
what they call te, karate, to protect their land. And they learn to fight um, as self-defense to preserve their legacy and protect themselves. And what I love about my story is me working at the farmer's market selling tea reminded me of my teacher when he would tell me that farmers started karate. They used the farm instruments, uh, the uh, bow, the uh, tongfa, um, the different farm utensils to fight. And basically the story goes that they protected the land. And my teacher said, Powell sensei, you're gonna protect the history through your teacup. Um, I was very much into tea. I would do the Japanese tea ceremony. We would have what we call a kampai and we would sit around and drink tea. And this teacup is my remembrance of the early days of Okinawa. And I told Bill about it and he drew a, a lovely image of the cup. I told Bill that the cup was in, math, it was in Martha's Vineyard, but uh -huh. my cup. there it is. It's right here. So yeah. you've, 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 you've I followed your, your yes. teachers. That's so it. So you, you kept your word to your teacher yeah. and you protected that cup. And the thing about the cup is, you know, when the kids train, we say you have to hold that cup. You have to hold that foundation. Don't spill a drop. So tea influence is, you know, is involved in, in Asian culture throughout the years. We all know it, the old story, you know, he walked through the garden and he had a cup of hot water and the leaf fell into the water. The water, water turned a color, he tasted, he loved the taste, tea started. Um, so in karate training, I try to pass that lineage of how tea, the farmer, the peasants, um, in a daily training. So we talk about hold the tea a cup, hold your foundation. So that's basically the story about um, the, the tea cup. So what's, what, what, tell us about this photo. So this is my teacher. This is Hanchi Robert Scaglione. Um, he was a New York City detective, um, worked up in Harlem. Um, this was again, late 60s, early 70s, tough times and, uh, in New York and basically saw an Asian man in a field doing karate. And basically the way I walked up to the gentleman that was playing the music that taught me how to play music said, what is this? And basically left the police force and took on what we call the path of training and became now the head of our, our, of our organization, which is called um, Yoshiro Shonru Karate. Master Yoshiro was his teacher. And this is my teacher, um, Grandmaster Robert Scaglione. And this was at a um, promotion and I received the rank of um, Denshi. Um, and that's me um, shaking my teacher, Hanshi um, Judon, 10th degree, Robert Scaglione. And that's a photo with the bow. We talked about the farm instruments. So that's a bow. The farmers back in the day would carry um, bales and fish on one end and stuff and they learned to fight with the staff. So that's a bow staff, um, Rucker Shaka six foot bow staff. And that was a demonstration at the Humble Dojo um, in New York City. And in the background to the right, that's Robert Scaglione. Um, next is Ansai Yashiro, his teacher. That's a gentleman that I told you that came to America in 1962 and brought Okinawan karate to America. And to his left is, uh, uh, Grandmaster Nagamini, um, who was his teacher. So we show the lineage, um, and that's what we do with the kids today. How the foundation began, who was your teacher, uh, who was his teacher, where did it come from? You should know your history. So our style, they call it a dinosaur style. It was buried in a mountain because we preserve the history. And that's what I love about tea, and that's what I love about Martha's Vineyard, the Bunny Cottage, that you have preserved the history. You know, a lot of styles have changed and morphed into different um, um, arts. Nothing wrong with that, but preserve the original root and then maybe train another style. So 
I try to preserve the root, the original root as it was handed down. And our style was considered handed down from father to son, son to daughter, and that kind of thing. For a while, they wouldn't even teach outsiders, but now it's opened up, you know, and we teach, you know, obviously to, you know, anybody that wants to learn, yeah, from the community. Here's some, stu here's some students, come on. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think I see her a lot at the farmer's market. So yeah, so that's Amelia. So this is a one of the um, kids' classes. Uh, we train now at the VFW Hall. Again, me loving the water. I mean, does it get better than this? Tap and see bridge in the background. When they light up the bridge, we're training, looking out those windows on the waterfront, the brook of the uh, Nyack Memorial Park, you know, sparkling in the background. And that, and there we are training. Uh, five days a week and, uh, you know, not as a commercial entity with a neon light, just word of mouth, community, and just, you know, trying to build warrior spirit and the young minds of, uh, you know, the minds of, of our next, you know, generation. And that's a class picture um, of some of the students over the years. This is when we trained in um, Nyack Fitness before we moved to Memorial Park. Um, that was our first dojo. So uh, Preston, I'm having a little trouble with my laptop. So when we're done and we take questions, I'll put a link in the chat then. Um, okay. Maybe Rosemary can do it. It's a uh, Karate Nyack. Yeah, I'll do it right com, now. So. Yeah, Great. so your yeah, Karate Nyack, um, dot com. Uh, and that's our, our um, one of my students, um, Tony made this, him and his wife. Um, and that's the tapenger you see behind me. Um, it was hand sewn, handmade. And these are the kind of things just, you know, one day walked in, sensei, this is for you, um, bowed, handed it to me for the dojo. Um, and tote means basically uh, karate. So tote yashiro, Karate Nayak, and we call it Karate Nayak, and it's a community-based dojo, all are welcome, um, seven and over. Some of us are as old as 72 years old training. Um, I'm 63, going on 64. So, and we all train together. You know, it's one big happy family. So then everything blends together into a cup of tea jevity. So how did the uh, name come about? So it's interesting. Um, one winter, you know, what, one thing we didn't mention that I used to be in the music, but after the club scene, I, I really got burnt out with the whole nightclub thing. I owned Bay Street for nine years. And on our 10th year, the landlord didn't want to renew our lease because again, we would do concerts. And again, you know, Simply Red, UB40, Tina Turner, um, Bobby Short, I mean, huge acts. But again, it brought a lot of money into the village and also a lot of traffic jams. So I think the town pressured the landlord not to renew our lease. It, it, it got, so at the end, when I got out of the club business, I got into managing acts. So I manage um, different acts for, for many years. And um, that really burnt me out. You know, I, I had my own kids traveling. So I said to my wife, I gotta make a change, you know, something, you know, with liberty, something with longevity. She said, that's it. Why don't you do a tea company? That's it, tea jevity. So this was like over the Christmas New Year break, and that January, tea jevity was born, and I started selling tea on Main Street in Nyack. Uh, Meg, who owns the uh, eyeglass shop, this is when she was on the same side of the street as Starbucks. She's on the other side now. I said Preston, just set up in front of my shop. It's okay. I mean, she said, "Do I need to go to?" Ah, no. Just do it. So I set up a table with one little tablecloth and we sold tea for a dollar on Main Street uh, in the winter. I mean, and people would look at me like I was, I had five, like, what is this guy doing selling tea? And slowly, you know, we built a small, you know, following. I kind of, you know, learned the ropes on, you know, what not to do, what to do, preserve my blend, you know, presentation. And then that summer we started at the Nyack Farm. They, they, you know, allowed me into the, the Nyack Farmer's Market that, that summer, you know, as it's the season started. 
So that's a family business, right? Right. So this is full fledged. So this is me and Jade on location, um, uh, selling tea uh, with tea merchants. Again, going back to the old way of the Okinawans, you know, uh, that were sea merchants and farmers. So we're tea merchants at the farmers market, essential workers um, selling food to the community. Um, and that's us, you know, doing what we do best. But um, you never know who's going to come to the market, huh? You never know who's going to show up. So um, this was Dr. Oz. He had come. I'm not sure why he came to Nyack that day, but I saw him and he, he, he walked by my booth and he kept walking. I said, Dr. Oz, you're not going to just walk by the booth. He said, well, I don't really drink, um, you know, sugary tea. I said, we don't have sugary tea. He said, I want to offer you. I, I love hibiscus. So I said, well, that's what I'm offering. He said, well, I got to have a cup of your hibiscus tea. So that's me handing him a cup of our hibiscus tea. And, and recently you had a concession at the uh, Mario Cuomo Bridge, right? Right. So we were asked to do the, um, you know, the, the ignorable, the grand opening of the um, uh, Mario Cuomo Bridge. Uh, this was the Nyack side. There was two sides. There's a side, uh, the Terrytown side. And this is the Nyack side. We live in, in uh, South Nyack, so it was perfect for us. And we took it full fledged. It was a great opening, great press, meeting people from Vermont. I mean, people driving down all over New York State. And again, this was right in the height of COVID, you know. And so it was really, you know, is this going to work? And um, we did it and loved it, had an amazing time. And I'm glad uh, we were the first to do it. And um, yeah, been there, done that, and loved it, and uh, on to other things. So what were you thinking in, in this photo? What's, um, what's going on through your mind? This photo was blessing up. Um, COVID had hit. You know, I wasn't sure in the beginning, you know, what are, are we going to make it? Do we pivot? You know, what do we do? So my wife said, no worries, we're going to pivot, we're going to work on our e-commerce, we'll make deliveries. So during COVID, and when it first hit, we decided to um, uh, make local deliveries, anything six to 10 mile radius of Nyack. So we would go to Piermont, Valley Cottage, Nyack. And basically when you ordered our tea um, for a home delivery, it was hand wrapped. Um, it was almost like getting a Hanukkah or a Christmas gift. Everything was in a beautiful craft bag with green paper and wrapped in, I mean, to the point now where people don't want to order on the website or come to the market because they want to get these deliveries because they're all hand wrapped. And this was a photo taken that I just looked to the heavens and said, you know, we're being blessed, blessed up. We're going to make it uh, through COVID and, you know, and we have, and we're moving forward. You have to continue to move forward. And by the way, um, Bill, and no one knew that, but even our karate dojo, we never stopped training. One of my students um, allowed us to train in his backyard. He has a lovely home um, on the Hudson down by the hook. So imagine training again, overlooking the, the Hudson River, all during COVID, um, all spring and um, um, summer. Um, yeah. So we're going to have a couple minutes. We, we, we've gotten to an hour. So um, mm -hmm. the, these, these programs, sometimes I've done one that goes to 8.15. So we'll give folks a chance to ask some questions. But we thought it would only be fair since the ritual of tea has followed you throughout your life that you, um, and you didn't mention too, I remember you told me how important tea was to the women at the Abyssinian Baptist Church. So tea culture has really been a part of your life from the beginning. So I thought maybe you could share with us how to make a perfect cup of tea. Absolutely. So, so first thing, you're right, Bill. So when I think of Black culture and I think of um, Black churches, boy, you got to sit down and have a cup of tea. Tell me about your day. Or if someone was sick or if someone passed in the family, you had to have a cup of tea. Everything was built around a cup of tea. So I remember that fondly as uh, a young boy growing up. And also when I managed bands, um, you know, you had to have tea in a dress room for the performer, you know, honey for the voice. So um, from managing artists on the road, how do, how do you have vitality? How do you uh, have the strength to play for six hours? 
what herbs do you drink? What, what does it take to preserve one's uh, immune system to be able to travel six hours, um, one hour's notice, hit sound check, perform all night. So a lot of tea secrets I learned from managing bands. A lot of my bands I, I manage um, were from St. Croix and from the islands, from Jamaica. And you know, Mon, you gotta have ginger tea. And so mixing ginger tea with elderberry and different herbs. So I, I really learned a lot about sea moss and iris moss and basically being almost like a tribal herbalist of uh, shaga and different type of teas. But on the Asian side, um, one of my favorite teas right now is oolong tea. And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk to you about oolong tea. So as Bill is showing this graphic of the teacup, it's very inf important to have your right vessel. Okay, so <laughs> your vessel is your cup. That's very important. So um, thank you. Thank you. Yes. one of the simple things you wanna do is have the proper drinking cup and particularly, hopefully one that you, is your go-to cup. You know its characteristics. Um, you know the how many ounces it is. Is it heavy if it's light? Um, you want to use hot water to bless the cup first. Um, never pour a beverage into your vessel with it being cold. So bless it and warm the cup up. Maybe hold it in your hand first. I mean, we're talking kind of very high level. This is when you're in your meditative moment, just you and you want to have your ceremonial cup of tea. Um, water is very, very important. Um, do you have mineral water? Is it spring water? Um, you know, is it distilled water? Worst case is tap water. But again, water is very, very important. Um, steep times is very important, especially for oolong teas. My favorite tea right now is oolong. I, um, I like oolong teas. Um, and for oolong green teas, they don't like long steep times. Um, so oolong tea, the steep time would be probably three minutes, maybe four. Um, but what I love about oolong tea, you can steep it multiple times. So this cup of oolong is probably my sixth cup today, but from one teaspoon. So imagine one teaspoon yielding six cups of tea and it still has an amazing aroma, amazing fragrance that when I get off this Zoom call, I'll smell the cup even though it's empty and that aroma is in that cup. So this is my oolong cup. I only pour oolong into this cup. And as this cup ages and grows with me that aroma builds into it. My grandmother would say, boy, you don't wipe my wooden bowl. You know, she would take oils and, and, and you don't wash it, but you may wipe it because you want the oils to uh, blend into the wood. It's almost the same thing with your, with your teacup. So I would recommend anyone um, to try oolong teas and it also burns cholesterol and fat. It helps stop you from having the appetite to eat because you drink so much tea. So you get a lot of liquid in your system and it's an amazing fragrance. So oolong is a very early Asian um, tea. Uh, I would call it a high-end tea, um, oolong tea. Yeah. So I rest my case. Preston Powell is the Bruce Lee of loose tea. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank Bill. You, and thank you, Rosemary, for this, um, um, for this, you know, community love. Yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. That was extraordinary. Um, just so many people that you've met, your whole family background is, I'm just waiting for you. To, I, I'm eager for you to write a book <laughs> about all of this. Let's, let's see everybody. Let's yeah. see if we kept anybody on. Okay. I know some people have left. Let's see. All right. There's one. Oh, I think it's me. I, I you know, 